Thanks so much, Roy, and thank you for the opportunity to speak here at, uh, at the University of Waterloo and, and the Waters, Water Institute, of course. So um, just to get me, get me started, I wanted to say that the presentation today is based on two pieces of work and, and a few other things besides, but two main pieces. One is the, a paper that came out in Nature Water a couple of weeks ago. It's still op open access. Uh, goals, progress, and priorities from Mal del Plata to 1977 to New York in 2023. And the other one is uh, there are several reports that came out by the Global Commission just in time for UN 2023. And I'm um, building or taking from um, the report, the what, the why, and the how of the world water crisis. It is one of seven or eight publications up there. So that's this publication. So there's several there. So if you want uh, more details about you know what's what, uh, they're in those two publications. And because, of course, these are publications not by myself alone, I, I need to acknowledge uh, a whole bunch of different people. I can't give you all the names from the Global Commission. It's just <laughs> too long. But I will highlight my two lead experts, uh, Joita Gupta, the University, Free University of Amsterdam, and uh, Arama Ravi, who's at the Indian Institute of Human Settlements in, in Bangalore. So at them, their teams, uh, including the... My team, which is, uh, consists of Safa and Fanayan, I want to recognize all of them, and of course, co-authors on the Nature paper, Asid Biswas and Cecilia Todahado, who also contributed. So that's by way of introduction, by way of acknowledgement. And let's take a journey uh, uh, 46 years since uh, 1977. And one of the things that you may want to know, in 1977, Indira Gandhi was the Prime Minister of India, Jimmy Carter was president of the United States. Dancing Queen was the, the big hit uh, globally uh, by the group ABBA. Uh, so uh, lots of things were different. Mansi Tungad, in fact, had died just before Mal de Plata, six months before, uh, 1976. So the world was a very, very different place in all sorts of dimensions, and including in the water dimension. So it's, in some sense, looking back to, to look forward. The key thing to, to, to keep in mind in that 46-year period, a number of things are the same and a number of things have changed. So in 1977, uh, uh, the issue around wash, you know, uh, water and sanitation and health was a big issue in 77. It's still a big issue in 2023. In 1977, there was a goal to, to actually ensure that everyone had adequate, th those, those were the, the, the terms, uh, you know, ad adequate and safe. The, the terminology has changed. Uh, by 1990, of course, it didn't, it didn't get achieved, but there's been a lot of progress since. And one of the big differences between 1977 and 2023, of course, is that CC, that, that two, two words, climate change, it just wasn't on the agenda in 1977. So some big changes. Um, and I just want to highlight, so this is 1977, of course, uh, at Mal de Plata. Um, there's a couple of other related, obviously, the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands in 1975. And as we go forward, you can see there's a, there's a whole series of, of conferences. Most of these are the, the big key UN conferences. Um, and so one to highlight is, is of course, uh, Dublin 1992. There are four principles that came out of Dublin. One was water as an economic good, but also the gender issue. The gender issue goes back to Mar de Plata. Okay, and then as we go on, of course, we had 19, <coughs> 1992, of course, the Rio conference, uh, UNSAID, and uh, the start of the climate change, uh, at least at a global scale, negotiations, we move on. Millennium Development Goals, they go back to Mal de Plata. Not all of them, but this is a significant number. And then we keep on going and going, of course, and then to go most recently, the high-level panel. Uh, I think it was six world leaders, including the Australian Prime Minister on that. And then, of course, we, we land in 2023 last week. Or was there, Sarah Wheeler, colleague and friend from Australia. Uh, a bunch of people were there uh, for UN 2023 uh, Water Conference. Where does that take us? Well, there's going to be a conference later this year on the SDGs, the 17 SDGs in September. And I think the finale for, maybe I shouldn't say this, I'm being recorded, but perhaps, perhaps the, a, a nice end note for our Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, Guterres, uh, the Summit for the Future in uh, 2024, uh, which is what do we do? How do we get it all together? Water is part of that story. 
climate change, biodiversity loss, there are many other stories that we have to fill. But that's a timeline that takes us 46 plus years. And so you can see when I'm talking about the goals, I won't give you all the details. There are 10 sort of key goals that came out of Mar del Plata. Mar del Plata lasted for 11 days. That's again, because it was 46 years ago, there's no way you'd have those sort of conferences going on for uh, 11 days uh, anymore. It was three days in New York uh, last week. And you can see these being shifted into into the SDGs, particularly the, the WASH, but there are other things. So, so it does, does have a history, and Mar del Plata is a key point of that. But it doesn't just go there, it also is going to MDGs, but also going into this high-level panel, and then in, into New York. There are five key, key areas out of, out, of, out, of, out of New York, and ultimately goes on into the future. And so, so the point about it is that what we did in this paper, the, the Nature Water paper, has just highlighted the goals where they mapped to and how they got transformed and, and developed over time, and new goals were added to. This is a, a, a word cloud. Of course, you see water. <laughs> it dominates, as, as you would expect, okay, um, in, in, this, in this. But this is Mal de Plata, 1977, and this is New York City, uh, 2023. And you can see that uh, the inclusiveness is coming in here that you didn't have uh, 46 years ago, the issues around youth, um, You've got issues around climate, for example, that wasn't there before. You've got issues around indigenous that were just not there 46 years ago. So there's an understanding, stakeholders, indigenous communities would say they're not stakeholders. They, they, they're something different. But you can see this idea of bringing in different voices, bringing in diversity to be able to respond to the global challenges. And that's a good thing. Okay. So let me keep to the good thing. <laughs> Uh, the glass half full or the glass three quarters full story. So the data changed in, in, the year two th uh, in the year 2000. There's a break point here, okay? It's just, okay, so we can't make direct comparisons across these two periods. That's unfortunately, that's the way the data is. But nevertheless, even with that break point, you can see we've made great progress since Mal del Plata in 1977. So this is the issue around the sanitation. And you can see we were, we're approximately now around you know, 60, uh, 60 odd percent uh, in terms of uh, the global population that has what's considered to be uh, you know, uh, acceptable uh, sanitation access. And then here's the safe water, which is the blue line. And you can see a higher proportion, you know, almost 70 percent of the global population. That's a very good news story. So to me, it's a glass half full story. Of course, 70% uh, means that 30% don't have access. And of course, this is around 60. That means about 40% don't have access. And this is differentially felt, OK? So women and girls are particularly prone to, to, to a whole series of issues around uh, sanitation issues, including their personal safety. Okay, going, uh, uh, and then there's issues around uh, who, who bears the greatest burden in terms of water access when it's not readily available. Again, that's a, that's a, that's a story that's not born uh, equally across different members of, of communities or indeed households. But nevertheless, a good news story. This is the, the less than good news story. So th this is looking at um, some key key measures, and there are other measures that we can use. So one measure that's not up here is what's happened to wetlands. The reason it's not up here, funnily enough, you might be surprised at this, there isn't annual data on wetlands in terms of the global, <laughs> global area. There are, there are data points, but there isn't, there isn't, in fact, the database, which is absurd to me that that's not the case. But what there are data for is data in relation to water withdrawals, and of course, that's broken into agricultural, industrial, and municipal aspects of it. And there's also data in relation to deforestation and the uh, total forested area on an annual basis and, of course, by regional. And so we can go back. This only goes to 2000, but we can go back uh, to 1977. And if we do go back to 1977, we can see it hasn't doubled, but it's, it's close to doubling. It's been a substantial increase in global water withdrawals. Uh, and what's happened to wetlands? It's decreased by about a third, maybe around 30% since 1977. And then deforestation is an ongoing, although the rate of deforestation 
is, is less. It's still ongoing. It's an ongoing issue. So therefore, the forested area on our planet is, in fact, continuing to decrease. It's not global in the sense that some parts of the world are increased, increasing their forested area, but there are other parts of the world which, of course, are more than uh, offsetting those, those gains. Uh, and so what does that mean? Well, deforestation, depending where you are in the world, has all sets of issues for water quality, you know, soil degradation, et cetera, et cetera. And so this has a whole a water story. It's, 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 it's a series of metrics that don't capture the, the full picture. But the picture it's telling is this, that on the nature side, okay, on the green side, if you want to call it, we have failed to deliver since 1977. So we've done pretty well on the gray infrastructure, and we've done pretty badly on the green infrastructure. So the gray infrastructure in terms of pipes and deliveries and dams, deliveries of water, particularly to urban communities, that's both global south and global north, we've been reasonably successful in the urban context. We have been less than successful even in that space, in the wash space and rural areas, but in the green green infrastructure space, I think it's, uh, it's definitely, my, 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 my view, a failing grade. We have failed. And what's happening right now in 2023, of course, it was different in 1977. We've got another multiplication factor <laughs> in terms of risk. And of course, that is climate change. And that also is connected, and these are not all, they're, they're all connected in some way or other, is the biodiversity loss, okay, which is, of course, related to the nature loss story. Now, the point about it is we're not going to be able to deliver the sustainable development goals by 2030 in the water space, or indeed any of the SDGs, unless we get the green aspect sorted. And uh, business as usual is going to lead to the the continuation of a whole series of problems and will get in the way of even the, the successes that we've had uh, to date. So this just looks at some of the data issues I've highlighted. There are deficiencies in the data, you know, at a, certainly at a country by country level. And this gives you some, some, some sense of some, some missing data in, 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 in that space of safely managed water. And then here's the summary table. I don't know whether you can see that at the back. It's summary table. Just to give you the point about the diversity issues, 2020, okay, this is for 53 countries in Europe. So this is a big, big, uh, 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 not, not necessarily how you would all think. It's not just in Western Europe. It's 82.2% in 2020, and you compare that to Africa. Africa, of course, has more than 47 countries, okay? That's a reporting issue, <laughs> um, you know, 17%. So, so huge diversity, even, even in the places where we've had uh, substantial successes. So that's the first part. And the, so I urge you to read that paper on Nature Water if you want to, if you want to do a follow-up. Uh, there's been eight, there are eight authors there, including myself. That just goes through the goals, um, the progress, and the priorities going forward. And one of the priorities we identify in that Nature Water paper is the green infrastructure. It's, it's, we just hi highlight that we're failing in that space. We've got to make, make, uh, make a big, big change, transformational change. So the second part of my presentation is to, um, is to look at the, the, the what, the why, and the how of the world water crisis. And um, I've been around enough to, to, to have conversations with various people. And some people look at me sometimes surprised, what do you mean there's a world water crisis? <laughs> so, and then if you go on and pursue that conversation a little further, then they say, oh, yeah, yes, of course, wash. So is there a crisis? Mm, uh, oh, yeah, I get it, it's wash, OK? You know, they don't get proper drinking water, for example. And then you go into this third level. It's, well, actually, it's not just about wash. Wash is very important, but there's a whole series of structures, issues around that. And of course, the place to begin is the water cycle. So this is the, the, the terrestrial water cycle. It doesn't include the oceans here, which a lot of precipitation on the world's oceans. So you've got 120 odd thousand um, in terms of precipitation across land. You get a lot of runoff, okay, that's, that's happening, okay. Um, but the accessible runoff is much, much less than precipitation, of course. There's a lot of um, uh, uh, precipitation going as soil moisture, which is then uh, used for vegetation, of course, and for growing uh, rain-fed crops. So accessible runoff is maybe 12,500 to 18,500 
cubic kilometers vis-a-vis -vis the precipitation of 120,000 cubic kilometers. Okay, and then you make the next step of where's that water going. You'll be familiar because you, you're all water experts. Of course, uh, a good portion of that, 70% of the water, blue water, that's the water in streams, aquifers, and dams, that's going for agriculture, and that is going for irrigated agriculture. And the water consumption of that blue water, it's about 85% globally goes into irrigation. So the irrigation story is a very, very big story here. So if you just ignore, ignore irrigation and how water is being used globally and just focus on the wash, you're going to miss a very, very big picture. And so this is a figure that we constructed. It's a simplification that has a number of simplifications in it, but it is useful to give you some sense of the importance of what I'm just saying. So here's the precipitation. Here's the accessible runoff, the 12 and a half to 18 and a half thousand accessible runoff. Okay, and then where's this going? Well, in terms of water consumption, uh, <laughs> most of it's going into irrigated agriculture. Of course, agriculture also uses a lot of water, you know, five to, to five, 5,200 to 5,800 perhaps uh, cubic kilometers uh, in terms of direct uh, soil moisture from precipitation. Uh, uh, and then, of course, there's natural vegetation. So, so we have to get that right. So in other words, what the, the colors here are quite useful in the sense that if we look and look at some, a series of numbers, and there's a technical report that goes, goes alongside this, uh, we have calculated there is a blue water consumption exceedance at a global scale you know, that is in this vicinity, you know, 161, you know, let's, let's call it 160 to something over 400 cubic kilometers. Now, that's at a global scale. So it doesn't mean that everywhere in the world is past blue water uh, consumption exceedance. That would not apply, for example, to, to Canada. Uh, but it, it also means that some parts of the world are really, really exceeding what, what, what we would consider to be a, a limit. And that, under business as usual, is going to get much worse. So in other words, what this is saying keeping in mind the consumption of most of the water that is blue water that has been consumed is for irrigation, we're going to have to do something in the irrigation space to be able to deal with this, this blue water exceedance, which of course is uh, overdrawing uh, groundwater issues around flows in terms of rivers. And if we do something on that space, how do you do it? Well, there has to be something in the green water space the rain-fed crops. So, so once you start doing that, if you say, well, okay, how we do this, rain-fed crops, that has implications around extensification of agriculture. That has implications around land use change, which then connects to climate change, which then connects to biodiversity loss, which then comes back in terms of water. So one of the things we have in the report, the, the, the what, the the why and the how of the world water crisis, we have a text box on the one trillion trees. How many people are familiar with the one trillion trees.org? Okay, some of you are. Well, I'm probably going to get myself into trouble, but you can read that text box to make it, <laughs> make it clear that there is no solution in that sense for the climate change crisis for sequestration with one trillion trees. We have more than three trillion trees globally with an tree density of around 720 trees per hectare. You take the same density we currently have, you add on one trillion trees, and you've got 13 million square kilometers of land <laughs> that has to be planted. That is not going to happen. It's, it's absolutely impossible, okay? That's bigger than Canada, <laughs> all right? <clears throat> There's only one country in the world that's bigger than that. That's Russia, okay? It's bigger than China, bigger than, you know, okay. Been, okay so, the point is, we've got to connect the dots. So if we've got to do something on negative emissions and sequestration, which we do, absolutely we do, we have to understand, well, how does, where do these one trillion trees get grown? Well, they're going to get grown in places where we're probably going to have to have extensification or we're going to have to do something else. So it's, it's a story where we're connecting the dots, understanding the system connections is critically important. And unfortunately, I have to say this, um, we're all stuck in silos, but I have to say uh, a lot of people are stuck in their silos. So, you know, they're in the you know, climate change silo or water silo, whatever the silos might be, and they're not connecting those dots. And if we don't connect those dots, I mean, da and Davos this year, da we're not talking ancient history here. Davos this year, okay, there was someone talking about one trillion trees. Okay, do the math, do the sums, 
connect the dots and we get, we start to understand what are real solutions and what are uh, pretend solutions. I'm probably going to get into trouble for saying this. I'm not trying to be personal. I'm just simply highlighting some, some, some facts. So, so these are some facts. Is here the water crisis. It's worth highlighting that it, we say water, you know, H2O crisis, but of course it's not a water H2O crisis. It's a, it's a humanity crisis. It's, a, it's an ecological crisis. It's an ecological, hydrological, social, and political crisis. So Roy and I had lunch together, so it was a, always a pleasure to, to catch up with Roy. Um, but, you know, there are approaches, there are strategies, options that are available, but those are off the table for a variety of political reasons. Um, I'm not knocking the politicians, I'm just simply saying there are, when you start to deal with the water crisis, uh, there's going to be winners and losers. It's, there's not enough water to go around that everyone can be a winner here. You have to then deal with those rough, those difficult uh, decisions, I should say. It's a multi-level crisis. It's both local to global. Again, when I talk to people about the water thing, oh, water's a global issue, a local issue. Why is it global? Well, you know, you connect the dots. I'll give you some dots to connect very shortly. When you start to think, well, hang on, how much food is traded in the world and how much water goes into that food? Okay, so once you do start doing the math on that, you realize that there's perhaps a one, possibly up to two, but certainly around one billion people that are dependent on food trade to be alive today. Okay, and then you look at, well, how much is that food trade actually coming from sustainable sources in the sense it's not overdrawing groundwater? Then you start to say, oh, gosh, you know, well, we've got an issue here. So that's how you connect the dots in the food Food, food and water space. And so that's the, the nexus issue, the food, the water, the energy, energy transition, climate change, and of course the last part of the nexus, which is often forgotten, the environment, or, or as the United Nations now uses, they've got the ecosystem. They call it the, the, the water, energy, food, ecosystem uh, nexus. Uh, this is a paper that just came out a couple of months ago uh, by Bridget Scanlon that, that led. There was a lot of co-authors in that piece, just highlighting the groundwater story. Um, this is, again, this, this issue around where we're exceeding blue, blue water consumption exceedance. So, you know, it, it's the usual story, so to speak, uh, you know, where you think you'd, uh, you would be exceeding it. It's this, that sort of the mid-latitude areas, at least on groundwater. In the case of Australia, uh, it's more on the surface water side rather than the groundwater side. But anyway, this gives you some sense that, that it's, yes, it's a global problem, but it's very much focused in particular regions of the world. And some regions of the world are much more important than others in the context of how many people live there, how many people are fed in those particular regions. So here's, here's one region here, and let's call it northern India. I'll call it the Indo-Gangetic Plain, for example. You know, we've got maybe 800 million people living in India alone in that area. So um, uh, northern China as well. Uh, so, so if things are going wrong here, let's say in the climate change space, if things are going wrong here in terms of groundwater extractions, as in we're depleting the groundwater resources, if things are going wrong in terms of the flows and the streams, then, and it's in those lo locations, they're going to be much more important than uh, a little island in the sub-Antarctic, for example. So just because the sheer population, the sheer size of these places. So those become global problems, especially, especially when you have food exports out of, out of, let's say, China and India or the United States okay, or Canada. <laughs> um, and so, so the issue is, is, you know, is, is always about connecting to me, to connecting the dots. This is a, not my our diagram, but we've, we've, we borrowed it. It's this issue around connecting waters, water, the water cycle, to a whole series of issues in relation to, in relation to food, at a, you know, particularly at a household level, but at a sexual level. And it's really about getting that security, you know, availability, quality, access, and stability, if you, if you will. And that's, a, that's the sort of dimension you can use in the context of food as well. How do we get that? that mix together. So it's the, the too much, too little, and too dirty aspects of water that we have to resolve. It's all of the above. It's not, okay, we'll deal with this one. No, it's actually all of the above. And so 
go back to the system of systems and connecting the dots, it's worth highlighting that the nexus issues haven't gone away. In fact, I believe they're going to accelerate and magnify and also increase in frequency. So we had the big, the, the, big, the big bang, so to speak. This was the big surprise for many, many decision makers. 2008, 2000, and they went a little bit young, 2008 as well. Okay, so we had uh, uh, increases in energy prices, implications of fertilizer prices. There were policies in some key countries in relation to biofuels combination of different things, and there were some weather-related events, all of the above, plus export restrictions. What did it mean? It meant food prices went way up. A lot more people ended up hungry or severely food, food insecure. Okay, so that led to the, okay, well, let's think about it, how we resolve it. Well, guess what? 20, <laughs> 2021, 2022, although it's now better than it was, uh, 18 months ago, it's still not out of the woods yet. Yeah, we get it again. And some people think it's just the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Yes, it's a contributing factor. It's not the only factor that led to this, okay? So something's wrong, you know? We've got a problem here, Houston, so to speak. Um, this, is, this is of global significance. Food prices rising, which are connected to weather-related events, not exclusively, there are other factors going on, have a big impact on what goes on in the world, okay? There's the story from Arab Spring, of course, the droughts in Syria, et cetera. So these stories can be told. The narratives are there. The point about it is it doesn't stay put in one place. It travels. This is why this is a global issue, even though water apparently is a local issue. And remember, of course, water is a transboundary issue. I live in a country where we don't have to worry about transboundary, at least with other countries. We have transboundary issues <laughs> within the country. Uh, but of many places in the world, transboundary issues, and how I, I don't need to mention this in, the, in, this, in this context in Canada, are, are, are big, big issues. They need to be managed and managed effectively. So again, it's, it's this transboundary, local, glo to glo global is, is a key issue. And then this just represents uh, virtual blue water flows over a period of time, 96 to 2005. Again, just highlighting that if there are some key countries here, I'm just let's not even get into how you calculate that and what it all means. It's just that there's some key countries here. <laughs> okay. So what happens in the water space in the United States has big impacts on a whole bunch of other countries in terms of food. Less so uh, for Australia, but big impact from China. Okay, um, so we have to, here's India. Okay, <laughs> India was a food exporter until last year. So, so if we're getting water crises, which we are, let's say in northern India, northern China, southwest United States, or you name the, the places that are significant food exporters, then what happens to their food exports? What happens to the countries that are importing those, that food. Therefore, you get the connection from water to food to a global, a global crisis issue. So, so I don't want to, there's a modeling, there's a, there's a technical report behind this if you want to go to the, the Global Commission on the Economics of Water to highlight this. We can argue around the nature of what happens to yields between now and 2050, and I'm happy to, there's a literature on both sides of this. I'm, 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 but we've made a call in, our, in, in the terms of our scenarios. But this is looking at what happens in terms of the number of additional food insecure people, severely food insecure, uh, by 20, 2050, okay? So in one scenario, it's 1.3 billion. So this is, the, this is the business as usual story. Business as usual under this context, which is heat stress and water stress alone in the context of blue water alone, we're not talking about green water sets of issues here, rain-fed agriculture. You're talking about a seriously bad news. This is, when I see this and when I show this to people, I expect people to be shocked, but I, I guess we're in a state of shock given <laughs> what's happening in the world. No, no, don't give me more bad news, you know. Okay, what, what's one, well, 1 1.3, this is, think about what that is, 1.3 billion people. This is, this is, you know, there's all sorts of consequences come, and not just for the 1.3 billion. Okay, so a migration crisis, a refugee crisis, a political crisis. If it happens in countries that are large, 
which have potential conflicts with other countries. We've had wars with other countries in the past. You know, you can see where this can go. It can go seriously pear-shaped. So this is a global problem. This is not somebody else's problem. Um, it's not just, oh, we can forget about it because we live in Canada. Not that you would do that. Uh, no. <laughs> uh, anywhere in the world <coughs> is an issue. And so this just looks at the uh, decrease in food supply, where it's happening. And so uh, this is seriously, uh, these are the to two most, of course, most populous countries in the world. India became the most populous country in the world uh, sometime uh, last year. It's now 1.4 billion. Chinese population has already peaked. India's population is growing. But you put China and India together, you know, it's a, a seriously a good chunk of the world's population. So that's just telling us something that we need to be very concerned about. Yes, Indians and Chinese need to be concerned by this, uh, uh, but it's not just them. Okay, the United States. Yes, it's a it's a smaller reduction, but we need to be concerned because the U.S. is a major food exporter. So if the U.S. is producing less food under this scenario, that means there's less food available for those that are importing food, um, let alone their own, their own problems in terms of food production. And then this is the, you know, the proportion of people who are going to be food, food insecure. This takes into account trade. So Australia has a reduction in its food production. So does the United States. So does Canada. Not an issue in the sense that they're food exporting countries. So, so the issue is, is not felt domestically in those countries. It's felt in those countries that are importing the food from, let's say, the United States. And guess where those countries are? Well, you see them right here. So the biggest, biggest problem is going to be in Africa. This is not insurmountable. There's a whole series of things that are underway that could happen and need to be supported in terms of increasing yields and increasing, um, you know, a whole range of you know, smart agriculture, et cetera, et cetera, ag agroecological uh, uh, approaches in relation to, let's say, parts for different zones where you are in Africa. So this is not insurmountable. This is business as usual. It means we've got to change what we're doing. This is not some incremental minor little change. This is not a tweak here and there. This is transformational change. And it's transformational change before 2050. That's 27 years away. It's been, you know, when, I, when I, we first did these results, we did it for 2100. And I looked at them and I said, look, when we look at 2100, people just, they'll glaze over. You know, I won't be alive in 2100. I could certainly be alive in 2050. So, so you know, we need to, and, and this is a, it gets much worse in 2100, okay? All right, so, so we got to change this around. It can be changed. And it should be changed. And so here are the issues, you know, the, the, the too little, the flood droughts, the too much, the floods, the climate change. These are all connected, of course, to climate change. Food insecurity I've highlighted. Wash, the good news story, but nevertheless, long way to go. But the wash story won't be resolved unless we deal with the green infrastructure story. If we deal with the rural, the rural poor in the global south, we've got to deal with the green infrastructure story. It can't just be about pipes, OK? Okay, we have to deal with the, the, with the quality of the water that they're having access to. Okay, so it's a green, very much a green infrastructure story in that sense. And then I just highlight this. This is in the report from the Global Commission. And I just want to highlight, that, I mean, I've done all of this, you know, the market values, cost-benefit analysis. This is all the standard, standard toolkit of economists. So I'm not knocking it. It's perfectly fine. I've used it. And no apologies. The point about it is this is the space where most decision makers are at, okay? They're into market values. <laughs> Things can be relatively easily measured. Uh, the sort of techniques that are being applied are the sorts of things that is where we are in 2023. What's missing is the value side, the non-market valuation in particular I'm talking about, but that has m different components to it. And they're different approaches, scenario, spatial mapping, et cetera. These are the, this is the missing picture, so to speak. We don't have to invent these. These, these already exist. <laughs> they just need to be brought in to the mainstream, so to speak, in terms of decisions. So we make those, when we make the trade-offs, and believe me, there are massive trade-offs here, we make the right sorts of trade-offs, not the wrong sorts of trade-offs. So the wrong sort of trade-offs has led to what I've just presented in the green space. 
the deterioration, the degradation in the green space. That's because this has been the focus. Okay? If you only evaluate the, the material or uh, <coughs> the monetary value from irrigated agriculture and you ignore, ignore the external costs okay, associated with that, then you're not getting the full picture. It's not like you don't want irrigated agriculture. You must have irrigated agriculture. But you need to be able to understand what those trade-offs are to make the wise decisions. And so here's some of the, this is not our work, it's uh, by Browder et al., but it looks at how you can do the green and the gray and try, try to get the complementarities between them. You know, and I highlighted and washed this issue of the watersheds, for example, wetlands. Uh, there's a whole series of things that are possible. And then, you know, finally, to, to, to end this, uh, and, and the presentation is this, you know, it's a very simplistic way of thinking about it. But, you know, we're on a business as usual pathway, and we call it, you know, I don't want to be extreme here, but it's a pathway to hell, basically. But we are in a situation now where we're in, I call it the no normal, okay? Others have used that term. It's not my term. The no normal. We're not, we're not new normal here. It's no normal. The world that we experienced in the last so many centuries or even past decades is changed, it's gone in, in, in a number of ways, certainly in the water space. So this business usual path is not going to lead to a happy space. So we have to transition. So maybe we're here getting towards three, so UN 2023 is a turning point, you know, and we go to a shift to a transitional pathway to bring in the sorts of things that I've been talking and hopefully in time to a transformational pathway. It will take time, but we haven't got much time left. One of the key stories I tell is in 1992, I was a young academic, and a colleague of mine had gone down to Rio. We talked about what had happened at Rio. There was some, uh, some excitement about it, but there was also some disappointment, in this, particularly in the climate, climate change space. And I remember, I was completely wrong, <laughs> so I remember saying, saying to him, uh, I said, oh, well, you know, we've got enough time. <laughs> we have enough time to fix this. Well, we ran out of time. 1992 to 2023. It's not like we haven't done climate change mitigation. Of course we have. But we haven't done what was necessary. And now we're, into, we're well over 1.5 degrees centigrade. That's, that's, a, that's history. The question is, is how much more are we going into that space? It's the same sort of issue today in 2023 in the water space. We had 1977 on and We now have 2023. We don't have, oh, well, you know, we've got 20 years to fix this problem. Well, remember those scenarios I was giving you? I'm not saying they're, you know, you have to judge yourself, the, the modeling behind that. But that's 27 years away. We don't have 20 years to, f to twiddle our thumbs and think that all is going to be fine. We have to get ourselves onto a traditional, transitional and then transformational pathway. We need to do it now, okay? We haven't got, we haven't got a decade to waste here. And so what does that mean? How do we do this? Certainly from, a, from my perspective, I don't speak for the Global Commission. Um, we have some ideas. We have presented them and some of them were today. Uh, we need to engage with a range of communities, uh, people who have voice uh, and, but are not being listened to. We want to listen to them and bring in the, their, their thinking, their wisdom into the sorts of things that we'll ultimately deliver in 2024 uh, for the summit of the future. And so, you know, we do gonna have to, we're going to have to do this, transform economic and social systems eventually, hopefully sooner rather than later. The key thing, the missing picture, the glass half empty is the the natural systems, the ecosystems, the green infrastructure. Uh, and then, of course, there's this integration. We can't, we've got to connect the dots, the food, the, the water, the energy, the ecosystem, all of the above. So that's, that's not the how. It, in some sense, it's just a summary of what the how needs to contain. The how is ultimately a series of actions at a local, ultimately to a global level that takes us on a transitional and then ultimately the transformational pathways. It's not going to be easy, uh, but um, there is, as they say in the, <laughs> in the political space, there is no alternative. Okay, there is no alternative because the alternative I've already presented to you, business as usual, is, is a very, very, very bad space. So at that point, I will, I'll end at a hopeful note. <laughs> I'm hopeful. I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be here. I believe there are things that can be done, should be done, must be done. 
Um, but business as usual is going to lead us to disaster. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, but when you look at some things that are happening locally, it can be frustrating and not always moving us. It's actually, you know, in many cases, moving us backwards. Like, I have a friend working in the Windsor area, southwestern Ontario, and a municipality just drained a wetland on the weekend. And they're selling their woodlots, and they're developing their natural spaces. And the provincial government in Ontario is um, removing the capacity of our local organizations to managing for water and managing for nature. And all of this is happening right now and taking us in the opposite direction. And I think a lot of organizations who are working on these issues are talking about the importance of wetlands as, as filters for water, as biodiversity, yeah. as um, you know, important flood mitigation. Yeah. But, but I'm not sure we are doing a great job of talking about that connection. Like, what are we risking? globally by making these local decisions. And so wondering if, I know you've hinted at some of this, but how do we bring that conversation to the local level when the decisions are being made? Yeah, so, so this is a, 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 a border issue. And of course, it's not just a water or wetlands issue. It's a, it's a climate change biodiversity issue. It's, a, it, it's a really around the nature of our, our, our governance structures. OK, so we live in a. Uh, democracy in Canada. We do also in, in, in Australia. So what's what's not working in the in the in, the, in our governance structure? Uh, and what's not working is that is transparency. So there isn't sufficient transparency. So so we could make a whole. You know, I'm not trying to offer simple solutions, but you know, there's a lot of stuff we could do with these. You know, in terms of acknowledging what's going on in terms of water withdrawals, wetland destruction, etc. That sort of stuff. Um, and some people are trying to do that, but that should be readily available, accessible. You know, uh, you know. So that's that's the first stop. We need to know what's going on. Second part of it is, you know, who. Uh, the nature of our, our, our structures is we vote every three years, every four years, or every five years. And so we're voting a government in um, with a, a series of promises, but, or, or they may or may not keep. But, but at that point, our democracy seems to stop. We go to the voting booth, and we, we, you know, we do our X or whatever it is. But then it seems to stop, because at the, that's just part, that's one part of it. The other part is the engagement by citizens. You know, into the governance and decision making. Now, um, if you have a situation where you have particular interests who are likely, and this is you know, this is the literature on this in economics. So you know, who have particular interests and are able, because of those interests, to avoid certain decisions, whether it be a, a developer or whether it be whatever it is. You then you write you provide a donation to political parties. You get influence that comes along with that, and then your voice dominates the voice of other people. And remember, nature doesn't have a voice. There's no voice for nature. I mean, it's only other people can give nature its voice, and and that's the problem in the in our uh, a democracy. Those with the influence are the ones who are typically have the water or, or whatever it is, or, or undertaking the emissions, et cetera, the big emissions for, for carbon, for example. And they are having the biggest influence on the decision makers for, for the reasons I've outlined. This is nothing new. There's nothing original in what I've just said. So, so what that tells me is that we have to change that structure so that we, as the people, so to speak, are more actively engaged and have influence in that space. And until and unless we do that, the fundamentals of what you've just talked about won't really change. 
The only way that changes is when there's a crisis, whether it's a pandemic or something like that, then governments are forced to change because people are saying, you must do X or you must do Y. We can't wait for the next crisis on this, this thing, <laughs> okay? And typically when crises come along, decision-making isn't always done at the best, <laughs> you know, because of the fear, of the, you know, the quick decision-making. This is a, this is a transitional pathway is about thinking this through carefully, making decisions over periods of time to get good outcomes, experimenting, learning, not everything's going to work, you know, all of that sort of stuff. So that's, that's by way of a long-winded response. That's the key, if we talk at least in democracies, that's how we have to engage here, to, because that's, that's the, the nub of the issue. That's the elephant in the room. Who has voice, who has influence, and who doesn't? And how do you change that so that we have a long-term perspective and a long-term outcome? It's the typical approach is to say, oh, look at politicians. They've got a three-year, four horizon. Oh, it's the politicians. No, it's not the politicians. It's the system that, that they're in is, is leading to those outcomes. We, have, we, the people, have to change that in, a, in ways that, that support long-term futures. Um, sorry, it's a long-winded response. That was a fascinating mm. talk. Really enjoyed it. I really liked it. When you were talking about it, in terms of connecting the dots, and how my question was, if you, can, if you look back and think about the many solutions to the thing that has happened, whether it be a trillion trees or your work on irrigation efficiency, yes. Yes. Yeah. And in some ways, the signs of that exist, that, that it will work, but still, as a society, we go all in. Do you feel we're still going to keep doing that? Do you see any movement away from that kind of um, like single voice solution without considering trade-offs across different sectors? Yeah, look, I, I think it's inevitable that you, you know, decision makers, they have to deal with much more complexity than I deal with in some sense. They have to deal with so many different interest groups, you know, short term, you know, all of that stuff. So, so when someone comes to their office and says, have I got a solution for you, minister? Ooh. <laughs> and they've got the nice power deck or, you know, exec X, Y, and Z. And, you know, we can talk about the big consulting companies as being, you know, the most effective people to doing that and making a lot of money out of doing that. Uh, but there are, of course, others, um, then that's, that, that appeals. That appeals a lot. Oh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah. It's not because politicians are stupid. They're not. Politicians are actually astute <laughs> individuals. But, but the point is the other voices are not there. So this is where I think the science community, and I mean that in a broad sense. I don't mean, I mean the physical, biophysical, social sciences, humanity. That community is, is somewhat isolated from well, actually quite a lot isolated from, from, from the de decision making. And I myself have been isolated for, 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 uh, for perhaps a, a couple of reasons. Um, but, but the point about it is it's not about individuals, it's about the community. That community's got to be there. It's got to be at the table. In the UN, there's, there's five key groups that they have at the UN for these, the UN 2023 Water Conference, but others, and one of them is is in fact the science community, broadly defined. It's got to be at the table, okay? Yeah, well, th yes, minister, but that's actually not quite, <laughs> it's not quite the true minister or, you know, th that sort of scientific advice, economic advice, whatever, that, that brings the, the, that connects the dots has got to be there, but often isn't there. It's just not at the table, and, and I think it has to be. And that's another part of the, uh, what we need to do. But yeah, ministers will always want to, in my view, want to go for a nice, easy solution. Yep, get it, thank you, move on. Tick that box. Yep. At the risk of sounding a bit more fatalistic, so the <laughs> yeah. IPCC is, is, is yeah. I think, one of the best examples yeah. of where scientists were very close to decision makers. They, yeah. Yeah. You, but there, there is a very good example, the IPCC, where, where, where the scientists actually collaborate directly. When yes, they do, states. yes. Uh, but they haven't been very successful so far. in um, so nudging political will seems to be key to, 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 to get what you want, and that political will doesn't really seem to be aware or as alert as, as you are. Maybe we need more political <laughs> 
<laughs> well, I'm not a politician, but, but, but no, I, I think IPCC has done a great job in documenting. It's no question about it. It's, it's a superb job documenting what's going on. It's, I think, quite a different story, as you just highlighted, Roy, quite a different story in terms of engaging with decision makers in terms of solutions. That's a, or options or whatever. I think that's a quite a different story. Um, so I think we're on the same page. I think you need the transparency, you need the documentation, absolutely. But you've got to be in the room when the decisions are being made. Some, in some sense, that's where the advisor comes in, uh, in, a, in a, you know, a, a direct way in that, in that sense around the, the key decisions in relation to, you know, let's say the energy transition. You know, the energy transition requires really good engineers, requires good economists, it requires, you know, all of the above, you know, climate scientists, et cetera, to work through and have talked these things through. Now, that doesn't always happen in the context of how we make decisions, but that's got to be part of a, you know, it's part of a, I mean, what do you want to call it, a round table or hub approach to, to, to decision making. I think that's, I think that, you know, people talk about it as deliberative democracy, but, but I'm, you know, and not just saying the science, there, you know, indigenous communities need to be there as well. So it's about bringing that, that together. It, it does take more time, it does take more effort, but my point would be, well, actually, <laughs> what have we done in, you know, over the last so many decades? We failed in so many dimensions, so what we're currently doing is not working. So let's move into another space, something, something different, see if that works and see what models might, might work. So that's how I would sort of, so. Yeah, the energy transition, of course, also needed a big disaster. <laughs> <laughs> yes, like yes, exactly. But you know, you're there again, if you had certain people in the room, maybe certain decisions that might have been different, uh, that might have been better decisions. But again, you know, you don't know. There are obviously the politics and the who has voice. But, but at least, I mean, the point about it is what I want, would want to happen is I want the minister or the prime minister, the president, I want them to know what those trade-offs are. That's the key point. They may make the wrong decision, okay, for a number of reasons I've already outlined. But at least if they know the trade-offs, that's, that's the first step. But I, I believe that a bunch of decision makers are making decisions without even understanding the trade-offs. And, and that's, well, well, you're not even on the first base at that point, are you? So, so that's where I think this, this sort of, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, the roundtable approach to deliberative democracy is that I think it's part of what we need to do as part of the reform process. It's a governance failure. It's a collective action failure that we're talking about. So, so we have to deal with that issue. We have to say, well, how do we transform that? I'm not a political scientist, but that's, that's where the problem lies. We need to fix it, okay? And we don't do it, we don't fix it by simply having an election every four years. That's clearly not working. Yeah, well, there were certainly multinationals at uh, UN 2023, and I'm, I, I'm glad they were there. I, I think they are part of the solution going forward. But, but we have to understand what their objectives are, okay? All right? Regardless of what the, the PR spin is, their objective is to provide uh, value for their shareholders, okay? And we need to make sure that they've got a regulatory environment around them where, where providing value for their show, shareholders is not at the expense of our long-term future. So, so it really gets back to that governance issue. So we can, I'm not gonna mention them, I'm being recorded, but you, know, you can point to certain companies that have done bad things, okay, but it's not the company per se, that's the incentive structures. I'm not excusing it, I'm just saying that's the incentive structure. So who's, who's, who, who's to blame? Well, ultimately, it's, it's, the, it's the regulatory environment, the monitoring, the compliance, all of that sort of, 
those sets of issues. It gets back to the governance issue. So yeah, private sector's got to be part of the solution. Private sector's got to be there as well. But they have to be constrained <laughs> in terms of what they do and how they do it. Okay, um, and then you know there are companies, and it's just not in the water space or the agricultural space. There, there are media companies that uh, that have uh, a lot of influence. Okay, and they're not directly in the in that, but they but they will represent particular points of view. Again, we need to have regulation around that. We need to have diversity in the media space, we, just as, as well as we avoid you know, mon monopolies or, 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 or concentrated market power. We need to do that in the media space. We need to do it in the, in the whatever, the, the IT space. We need to do it in the, you know, the railroad space, whatever it is, the transportation. You know, this is the part of the, this is where we need to be active active in the sense of ensuring that the corporations, big or small, operate with the rules of the game that allow them to, to make a buck for their shareholders, which is fantastic, but not at the expense of everybody else. And that's where we, the people, have to, have to, have to, have, have to, have, have to step in. And that's where transparency is really important too. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm getting a bit long-winded here, but the greenwashing, you know, there is an incredible amount of greenwashing. There was a recent study just came out just before Sharm El Sheikh. I mean, it's unbelievable the greenwashing and a lot of money spent convincing people that Company X is doing such a wonderful job saving the planet. Okay, so uh, once you have, once people believe that, then they believe, oh well, things are, you know, things are getting better. Or, well, you know, it's quite the opposite. Uh, for some some of these corporations, so so we have to make sure that the you know truth in advertising, <laughs> you know uh, accountability, all of the above is 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 part of it. But that again, that's a regulatory environment. Um, if they get away with it, they'll get away with it. <laughs> so so we need to make sure they don't get away with it. It's Reminds me of this uh, Okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah.